Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Amsterdam. I'm very sorry that I can't welcome you here in person, but I hope we can meet in the near future, either at the WFA or BVA event. My name is Henriette van Zwinderen, and I'm the managing director of BVA, the Dutch Advertisers Association, also known as the Network of Brand Leaders. As one of the national association members of WFA, we enjoy working together with WFA on advancing the interests of brands and marketers. WFA on a global level and we as BVA on a local level. BVA was founded in 1919, so we recently celebrated our first century. For that celebration, we used the theme brand power impact and responsibility of brand leaders. And that theme very well expresses our common belief that brands can actually contribute to a better society. Now, as a national association, it's quite easy to claim that all brands and all companies should actively pursue this. But what really counts are the brands and companies that are actually realizing results in this area. And I don't know of a company that's in a better position to share with us how they're doing that and how, what they are achieving with that than Unilever. It's therefore with great pride that I introduce to you the next speaker, my fellow Dutch woman, Corny Brahms. Corny is Unilever's chief digital marketing officer and she will share with us the business case for sustainability based on decades of learning from Unilever's sustainability journey. Connie will go into the role of marketeers that they can play in making brands sustainable and making sustainable choices easier and preferred. Ladies and gentlemen, Connie Brahms. Without question, Unilever needs to have a 100% deforestation-free supply chain, including on peatlands and tropical rainforests. I want Unilever to safeguard and improve water supplies in its factories and for the communities around it. It's not enough to help farmers and smallholders protect their land. Unilever needs to go much further and ensure they benefit much more from their hard work. We need Unilever to help our farmers regenerate nature and biodiversity. It's imperative that Unilever takes significant science-based action on climate change well ahead of the 2050 deadline set by the Paris Agreement. Unilever must make sure all the plastic it uses is recyclable, reusable or compostable within five years and kept out of the environment. Like everyone at Unilever, our ambition is not just to make the world's best consumer products. In doing so, we want to leave the planet in a better state than we found it. This is why we're taking action to deliver zero emissions by 2039. To have a deforestation-free supply chain. To work with farmers and smallholders who can help us protect and regenerate nature. To preserve water. And keep plastics out of the environment. That's why our brands are investing one billion euros in a new climate and nature fund that will allow them to take action over the next 10 years to fight climate change, to regenerate nature, and to preserve resources for future generations. And if anyone thinks these aren't worthwhile ambitions, I'd just ask, what planet are you on? Hello, everyone. It's an honor to be following two of the world's most legendary pioneers in sustainability, Sir David Attenborough and Johan Hockström. And thank you, Henriette, for the kind introduction. And of course, thanks to WFA for having me. 
The video that was just played was created with many of our employees last year to support a series of commitments we made to help improve the health of our planet. And I'll get into these a little bit later. But I wanted to start by echoing Sir David's call that saving our planet is now a communications challenge. And I truly believe as marketeers that we have a unique role to play in communicating clearly and compellingly the benefits of making sustainable choices and adopting sustainable behaviors. Appealing to the head and the heart as great marketeers do and making sustainability an integral part of the overall brand proposition. And in this way, I am sure we can make the complex simple, both for our consumers and also for ourselves as marketeers. As Henriette said, at Unilever, we have a long held belief that being a responsible, sustainable business makes us a stronger and a better business. And the notion of doing well by doing good goes all the way back to one of our founders, William Lever, who launched Sunlight Soap in Victorian Britain to help tackle infectious diseases at that time. And this belief has been with us ever since. And the evidence has only become more compelling over time. And can you believe it's already 10 years ago that we launched the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, or the USLP, as it's widely known. And in these 10 years, we have avoided 1.2 billion euros of costs as a result of sustainable sourcing and eco-efficiencies in our factories. Our leadership in sustainability has acted as a magnet for talent, and it makes us the number one employer of choice in 54 of our 75 markets in which we measure this. And most importantly for today, our purpose-led brands have been growing twice as fast as the rest of our portfolio. So for us, the business case for driving sustainability has been proven. More growth, less cost, less risks, and better talent. And we've learned a lot over the past years. And I wanted to share just three key learnings. And the first one is set ambitious and bold targets. And even initially, we didn't really know how to reach them, but we did have a clear direction and we were committed. And we have seen that challenges spark creativity to solve complexities on the way. We know that this works in business. We know that it works in driving DNI and it works in sustainability too. The second biggest learning for me was measuring success is actually difficult. And when we set our USLP targets, we knew that they were very ambitious and that we needed to work immensely hard on multiple fronts to meet all those targets. But what we didn't realize at the time was how hard it was to measure our progress. And honestly, we still don't have all the answers. And the third one brings us closer to our profession. Making change happen internally is actually a great start. But the hardest part is to help consumers change their behaviors and embrace more sustainable practices. Our targets for greenhouse gas and water, for example, included the ambition to help consumers change the way they wash their clothes or take showers. And in all honesty, we have not been able to offer enough solutions or incentives to make this all happen at scale across the world. So lots still to learn and to practice and to get better at. And whilst we were learning, we also know that today, sustainability leadership looks very different from what it looked like a decade ago. And we've just heard the bar is only gotten higher. The twin challenges of climate change and social inequality and the many, many issues that derive from these have only become more profound and more urgent. I don't need to tell you that. The role of business must be to address these challenges. And it's not only in doing less harm the way we started off, but more so about doing more good. And I also believe that sustainability has shifted from being seen by many as a costly add-on to being an integral part now of business profitability in the short and in the longer run. And more so, it's actually viewed by more and by many as a business opportunity to drive consumer preference while we're doing good. And actually, sustainability is now a mainstream consumer trend. And COVID-19 has only intensified this. We've just heard that as well. And I wanted to share a couple of numbers to illustrate this from the consumer perspective. 
65% of consumers are planning to be more mindful about the impact of their consumption after COVID or living in COVID. And they're also expecting this greater sense of responsibility from businesses and brands because 33% of consumers have stopped using a brand that they don't feel responded appropriately during the pandemic. And 74% are warning that companies placing profits before people will lose their trust forever. What has also happened is that global connectivity, the smartphone, social media, they've all helped to change the level of transparency, making the effects of climate change, for example, more visible, as well as creating more platforms for all voices to be heard. And the amplification by high profile figures such as Sir David Attenborough has helped to solidify the impact of human choices and consumption on people and the planet. That said, Let's not shy away from the fact that product performance and cost efficiency are still the two dominating factors influencing buyers' decisions. But the sustainable profile of a product and the environmental and social cost of how it's made increasingly play a role in driving consumer preference, as we've heard from Edelman. So, in my view, the sweet spot is in getting it right. The dual nature of value for our brands. Value in terms of offering the right value equation of superior products at affordable prices and values for having a point of view on matters people truly care about and more importantly, take action to drive positive change. Now, and as time has moved on, the USLP has served as well as a separate plan, but we wanted to really step up in Unilever and create a fully integrated, sustainable business strategy in every possible way in whilst doing business. And a few weeks ago, you might have seen that we've launched the Unilever Compass, our sustainable business strategy. And at the heart of it is the same purpose, making sustainable living commonplace. And I'm sure that you will, you will find, make it uh, sound, feel sounding as a catchphrase to, to, uh, to many of us, but it sounds a bit like marketing. But what it really means is that we want sustainability to be commonplace within our business and also our value chain. And we want to help as many people as we can do to do the same, to live sustainably as sustainably as possible by making more sustainable choices. Now, this compass, the Unilever compass, is driven by our three beliefs. People with purpose thrive, companies with purpose last, and brands with purpose grow. And within all of this, we have articulated how our business and how our brands will work to firstly improve the health of our planet through protecting and regenerating nature, striving for a waste-free world, and accelerating climate action. Secondly, to improve people's health confidence and well-being through positive nutrition. And thirdly, how we contribute to a fairer and most socially inclusive world by helping raise living standards and preparing people for the future of work. Now, that all sounds very encompassing and probably even complex for you, but what does it really mean in practice? And what does it mean for our brands and the way that they show up for consumers? A couple of examples. The first one. We have committed to zero emissions from our operations by 2030 and net zero across our value chain by 2039. Alongside this, we are working to introduce carbon labeling on all our products to show how much greenhouse gas was emitted in the process of manufacturing and shipping them to our consumers. Now we're talking in Unilever uh, of around 70,000 products. So it's really ambitious, this project. And it requires a lot of help and support from suppliers, tech partners, and many others. But we will make it happen. And maybe you've seen that also today we launched that one of our brands, Omo, um, one of our detergents brands, have launched in China the first ever laundry capsule made from industrial carbon emissions. And we've worked together with our partners, Lanza Tech and India Glycols, to turn waste carbon into an opportunity and it's just one in a series of innovations that we're investing in as a part of our effort to eliminate fuel-based chemicals from all our cleaning and laundry products by 2030. And innovations like this will help to make sustainability easy and simpler for everyone that uses our products without compromising on performance or affordability. 
But that's not the only thing our brands do. Our brands are also helping to provide access to safe drinking water for those who don't have it, to safe and clean toilets. They're championing issues of social inequality, where we spent yesterday on with the WFA. Thing, uh, matters as uh, campaigning for migrant rights for Ben and Jerry's, or DAF and the Crown Coalition, working to end hair-based discrimination. Or our food brands, which are promoting healthier plant-based eating, something we also just talked about. But take Knorr as an example. Knorr launched in 2019 the Future 50 Foods. And that is foods that are good for you and good for the planet because it advocates a more diverse diet in a very simple way, promoting biodiversity. And the brand is now committed to promoting a very simple message, change the world by changing what's on your plate. In fact, the real role of and the biggest challenge for brands is to make sustainability less confusing and more appealing, in my view. Because while sustainability is integrated into everything that we do at Unilever, much of our sustainability stories are told by our brands through creativity, compelling storytelling, and engaging platforms. And I'd like to share now with you three very different examples of our brand work. We all know change has to happen, but real change, it doesn't just happen in the comment section. Hashtags can't plant trees. Tweets won't clean oceans. For real change to happen, we need to roll up our sleeves and get dirty. And at Purcell, we're changing too, with bottles made with recycled plastic and a new formulation with plant-based stain removers. Purcell, tough on stains, kinder to our planet. The Nintendo game Animal Crossing offers calm, control, and cooperation in a time when the world is 24-7 coronavirus. Moms and millennials took to it in droves. My daughters and I played Animal Crossing all day yesterday on Nintendo Switch. Have you seen this game? All right, there's nobody here. But did you know Animal Crossing has a food waste problem? Players buy and sell turnips. But if the turnips aren't sold in time, they spoil. Hellman's believes food is too good to be wasted, even virtual food. So we created Hellman's Island. Then we invited the entire community to help us turn virtual food waste into real food for people in need. For each spoiled turnip players dropped off, we donated a real meal to the Second Harvest Food Rescue. The campaign reached over 47 million people. 84% of visitors said they would change their food waste habits. We even made the front page of Reddit. Most importantly, we donated 50,000 meals to people in need. Red Zero is a vegan replacement for Carmine, an ingredient derived from crushed female insects that is still used in most color cosmetics today. There are 70,000 female insects and one pound of Carmine, resulting in as many as a thousand insects in a single lipstick. Because Carmine's vibrancy and boldness are difficult to recreate, finding a comparable vegan substitute seemed impossible, until now. Hourglass and the scientists at Unilever were able to replicate the same color intensity in Red Zero using patent-pending vegan pigments. The name Red Zero? It symbolizes Hourglass's commitment to animal welfare. Zero animal byproducts, zero insects harm. Red Zero, color of cruelty-free. I really love these examples. And I hope you do too, because through purpose and innovation, they communicate the benefits of making sustainable choices and adopting sustainable behaviors in a quite simple and compelling way, I think. And brands have a great window of opportunity to drive transformational change. And quite frankly, we are pushing at an open door. Buying is no longer just a transaction. It's a chance to make an impact, to vote with your wallet for brands that align with your values. Yet, our own research tells us that the greatest barrier for people to make sustainable choices today is access to information. 44% of our consumers don't trust the sustainability claims on products, 
And the WFA report launching today also identifies research that shows that over 40% of consumers feel brands make it harder for them to live sustainably. Now, these figures are astounding. They confirm that we're not doing a good enough job in communicating sustainability. We really need to do better. And this isn't just about convincing people to have shorter showers, eating less meat or using refills. It is also about making sustainable choices simple for them. It's recognizing that we haven't always made it easy for people to see both the value and the values of their chosen products. It is also why today, with the WFA, we are calling on the industry to mobilize and help lead on sustainability issues by committing to the Planet Pledge. It asks for our commitment to the global race to zero and our capabilities to lead for climate action, as well as a clear priority to unleash the power of marketing to drive more sustainable consumer behaviors and reinforce a trustworthy marketing environment to make sure that the messages our brands represent can be trusted. It's time. It's time to close the say-do gap between what brands say about making a difference and what brands are really doing. We call these brands that say and do our brands with purpose. Brands that take meaningful actions over a sustained period of time with measurable results and which proactively communicate a purpose which highlights and addresses an environmental or a social issue and they're working to solve this. Because in the end, the business case is clear. Purpose grows brand power and brand power drives market share and in turn, brand growth. And actually there's an abundance. There's an abundance of issues to choose from which your brand can authentically help to solve. I would say commit to one, take action, get creative and work with your partners to make an impact. Because no one can solve these big problems alone. It requires really collective action to drive meaningful change. And trust that in the end, consumers will keep our brands honest with their voices and their choices. And this brings me to my close. Sustainability can be complex, and we as marketeers need to make it simple. Making the complex simple is precisely what marketing is good at. We know how to innovate and distill messages, how to make them easily understood and compelling. And while making it simple for consumers, we also need to make it a bit simpler for ourselves. As I've laid out, Unilever didn't have and still doesn't have all the answers. But it starts with wanting to make a real difference, prioritizing it, and setting relevant targets for your brands and your company. And then acknowledging that even if you don't achieve what you set out to do in the first time, you haven't failed. You have course corrected, and we have needed to course correct many, many times. And we continue to learn from the things that are not working out the way we had planned them to work out. And we have brands whose purpose is very clear and very compelling and others that are still working to find theirs. But if you are striving towards a worthwhile ambition, trust you're on the right path and keep going. Make the complex simple, even when it might seem impossible. They said it could never be done. That plant-based food will always taste like plants. They said, how dare you butcher our traditions? Even your name makes no sense. And we must sacrifice it all. The vegetarian butcher says, sacrifice nothing. Hello, Connie. Hi, Stefan. Thank you for sharing such a bullish and positive story of a company which has actually embraced <clears throat> the sustainability challenge and the call to action, which we just heard from uh, Sir David Attenborough and Professor Rockström. Um, I, we have a couple of minutes for a Q&A, and I'd like to um, invite our um, audience to, to share those questions in the Q&A widget. But let me start with the first one, Connie. Um, we're hearing uh, from plenty of research about how consumers are actually prepared to change their consumer behavior, to move to, to, to choices that are more sustainable. At the same time, in the middle of this pandemic, 
we're seeing e-commerce goes through the roof. We see these delivery vans uh, all over our neighborhoods. How, how do you reconcile this apparent contradiction between what we're hearing in terms of intentions and what we are seeing for the time being in terms of acts? Well, Stefan, let me first acknowledge that, of course, you're right. And uh, we haven't only seen it in COVID, but even before that, uh, we, we have research saying that uh, I think 88% of people said that buying products with reduced packaging is important, but only 20% really does it on a regular day-to-day -day basis. So, um, and I think what you're expressing is also what we see when people are saying, oh, I try to buy from companies with a genuine concern for the environment or... I think it's 65% of consumers are planning to be more mindful about the impact of their consumption. And the critical words are obviously trying and planning. And, um, and I think it only highlights what I've tried to say in, uh, in my talk as well, that we need to get real on what the barriers actually are for consumers. And we need to work to alleviate them. So, and what are those barriers? I think it is time, it's convenience, it's price, it's access to information, confusion, a lack of trust. And in the end, I think we as marketeers, uh, we really need to make sustainable choices simple and preferred, uh, especially at the moment of purchase. And that's what you're referring to as well. These are tiny moments in, uh, in consumer experience journeys. And then it needs to be all coming together and make it simple to make the right trade-off. But it also starts a bit with us, isn't it? We need to close our own say-do gap and uh, really communicate honestly about what are the things that we're doing to make our products more sustainable and our services more sustainable. And we need to do it not only in a way that makes it simple, but also compelling and make it a movement that people want to belong to. And we also need to be transparent, I think, um, because not everything is solved, but let's all aim to make it so much easier because the intention is there and there's blockers in the way for consumers to really act upon it. And I think that's, well, the real challenge, but also the exciting opportunity for marketeers, isn't it? Connie, we have here uh, the question that is trending on top, um, which is about how can we ask a brand to be speaking simply about sustainability when sustainability is such a complex issue? So how can we be simple without being simplistic? No, how, how would you respond to that? Well, isn't it um, uh, with most things in life, you just first need to go through the complexity of it to be able to make it simple again uh, and to really get down to, um, um, to the bottom of matters. And um, I think we should not confuse the consumer by the complexity that sustain sustainability brings, but because indeed it is a complex matter. But what we need to do is focus on one or two of the most pressing issues that per brand can be different and then uh, provide an easy solution for them. Either it could be a solution that people don't even need to think about, but just buying this product or this brand makes that you're contributing to a more sustainable planet. Or we want them to actively really take in this, the information we give them. But we are also used now, also with all the digital tools available, that there's different levels of information that you can provide to people. So for the more interested one, the dark green ones, you probably want to provide more information, whilst um, maybe for the masses at this moment in time, you just want to reframe to what is the crux of the message. And that's what I try to say. Distill the message that is really relevant and do the hard work in the back office, uh, in our own businesses and working together with our eco partners. Connie, one of the things which I, I find particularly striking hearing you here, <clears throat> but also more generally uh, Unilever speak about sustainability, is, is the candor with which you talk about what works and what doesn't work. Yeah? And, and, and this acceptance that no, you're going to be learning from, 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 from what doesn't work. There's a question here about, is there, is there an example of a brand <clears throat> in the Unilever portfolio which has embraced a sustainability issue, which and it, in the end it didn't turn out to work? You know, is there, some, sometimes as a marketer you learn actually more from the failures than from success. Is there something you can, you can share there? Oh, yeah, I think we've got plenty. But um, I think one of the striking examples that I've always remembered was with Domestos. It's one of our cleaning hygiene brands. And we partnered with UNICEF to build toilets, build toilets in India. That's where we started. And Domestos is a huge brand there. So 
But actually, we soon realized that the impact that we were having was so limited and we were really stretched beyond our core capabilities. And then actually, Simran Jill, who is, was our assistant brand manager at the time, he told us, you know what, toilet building is not something Domestos is synonymous with. And uh, what we really are is a toilet cleaning brand. So, and then we course corrected and we said, you know what? Let's join forces with the India government because they were implementing a toilet building program. Actually, the real problem that we could solve was that people didn't know how to maintain the toilets. So, and we realized that actually a lot of these toilets that were being built were not properly maintained. And then the Mestos switched not from uh, so from building toilets to actually fixing, cleaning, and making toilets safe to use. And um, this became a practical, replicable behavioral change program together with UNICEF again. And actually brand communication played a real important role. And now if you fast forward to, I think it was 2020 when I saw that Domestos already in 2019 actually met its original target of reaching 25 million people with clean, safe toilets. And this was a winning purpose for Domestos but by focusing on the wrong thing, we actually didn't make it in the first place. And we, well, one of the overused words, pivoted to something that was much closer to the brand. And by working together, we could achieve what we set out to be a 10-year journey in uh, three or four years. So that's probably a nice example, Stefan. Thank you. Um from where you sit, you know, a company which operates in, in so many markets, I mean, almost every single country on the planet where, where Unilever is present, how do you see the sustainability and climate change challenge come to life? And, and, and how are those differences managed from a, from a global perspective? You know, can you give a few examples in terms of what it requires in terms of local adaptation in order to be relevant to the local context? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Stefan. So um, and whilst I am a firm believer in the 17 SDGs, uh, as defined by the United Nations, because they are an excellent framework high over of sustainability initiatives, I think the strength of the execution of what brands and companies do is determined by how well you tap into what the local consumer really wants and needs of you. And we already saw it before covid when you take a look at um, maybe one of the things that has always stayed with me is um, there is a stronger desire for change from consumers in developing and emerging markets than we might actually think. Uh, so if you take a look at plastic research, we see that 73 to 83% of people in India, Mexico, Indonesia, Thailand and Vietnam strongly agree or agree that they're trying to reduce their plastic use which compared to countries like Japan, Australia, US, Finland, it is 50 to 70%. So there was already quite a difference in, uh, in desires and in, um, in attitude. And COVID has made it actually a bit more diverse um, because what we have seen is with economies starting to open up and where spending increases, you see an uneven K-shaped recovery. So a real deviation in consumer behavior, those with secure incomes, are moving towards buying less and buying better. And those with financial pressures are seeking out value. And that comes back to my point of wanting brands, FMCG brands, to provide both value and values. Um, so that is one. The recovery of COVID is also at completely different speeds across the world. And that will have a huge impact as well. And uh, we know probably also by today the devastating stories we hear of India and Brazil at this moment in time, whilst a part of uh, the US and the UK and Europe are getting vaccinated. So it is truly important when it comes to messaging that you strike the right chord, that you tap into what really matters for people. And that's why one of the pillars in marketing for us is always get real. Get real and join consumers in the causes that they, that they champion. But if you take a look, for instance, at Dove and the execution is a well-known example because you asked for an example where, um, where the definition of beauty uh, needs to be broadened and way more diverse than the way that we have uh, set it out uh, a couple of years ago. Also, these are uh, the, the general insight is the same, the purpose is the same, the sustainability cost is the same, but the way we execute it needs to be locally relevant. 
Thank you, Connie. And I'd like to conclude on one last question, which is a bit more personal, which is about a different facet um, of sustainability, which is diversity and inclusion. Now, you're a, you know, um, a, a senior female executive leader you know, with a very successful career path in Unilever. Um, our conference is very much looking at what we need to do better and how we need to reinvent the industry in order to be addressing head on the question of diversity and inclusion, including gender, but there are of course many other facets. Can you share a bit in terms of what it meant for you? No, have you uh, how have you overcome that, that glass ceiling? How did you break through the glass ceiling on, on, your, on your career path? <laughs> yeah. Seven, thanks. Uh, this is always a fascinating question because people think there is a recipe, uh, but I can always share, of course, that firstly, I really believe in the business case for diversity. Uh, so it's become one of my beliefs. And, I, and even related, and I know that you've talked about it yesterday, that unstereotyped ads deliver better creative effectiveness, stand out better and increase brand power. So the business case for me is, is very clear. You need in a complex world as the, the world we live in nowadays, diverse points of view, diverse voices, and that will only bring us to better solutions. Now, and then more... Uh, personally, um, I, I have always felt energized by combining a very exciting job, whatever it was and wherever it was in the world, with an enriched, enriching family life. As my recipe was, I don't try to be superhuman in all I do, but I realized I was lucky to be part of a company that really values d &I. I had role models. I'm trying to become a role model myself. I really focus on outcomes. And whilst I do not take myself too seriously, I take my family, my purpose and my responsibility um, very seriously at work. So my purpose is energized to explore and jointly create a better future for all. And that keeps me going, that kept me going and will keep me going. Thank you. That's a wonderful way to end our Q&A. Thank you so much, Connie, for joining us today. Thank you, Stefan, and good luck with the rest. So we're now going to go uh, for a short break. So if I could ask you to go to your schedule and uh, click on the link to the next session. See you in a minute.